Welcome to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life. My name is Tracy Crow. I'm an author, writing coach, and Marine Corps veteran. I'm looking forward to co-creating today's show with you. So if you're ready, are you ready? I'm ready. So if you're ready to live a more creative, more magical life, let's get started. everyone. Welcome to episode 26. Ooh, is that possible? 26 episodes already? Yes, here we are. Episode 26. Okay, April is National Poetry Month, so I thought it would be fun to invite poets, some I know quite well and others hardly at all, to record themselves reading a few of their poems. This was meant as a way of honoring their work, but also as a celebration for how this genre of writing encourages us to listen acutely with our minds and with our hearts. You know, you may recall that in previous episodes, I've mentioned that poetry inspires us not only to read the lines, but to read between the lines for meaning and even to read beyond the lines. I think you'll agree that the incredibly moving poems from these six gifted poets encourage us to see life from you perspectives and perhaps with even more meaning. Mourner's Purple Valerie Neiman. Someone else's dog knocked the African violet from my table. A few fleshy leaves snapped off, but the rest stayed lush, the consequences of amputation slow to move through green tissue. The broken stems remain full of fluid, repellent really, how they can rot and shrivel at the same time. This plant demands coddling, to be soaked in a warm sits bath, lest its plushy leaves, spattered by cold drops, spot and separate. I sweep up the gray dirt, find I'm craving water. Hard rain or warm puddle, doesn't matter. Chandler from Duluth, Minnesota, and here are three of my poems. The first poem is called Slipping the Surleys via High Flight by John Gillespie McGee Jr. Oh, I've slipped the reflective belt and dirt and danced the skies on my dust covered wings. Sunward I've climbed and tried to stay alert with my go pills and flew a thousand rings you have not dreamed of. Wheeled over the dung, high and light brown violence. Capping there, I've chased the stinking wind along and flung my eager craft through sandstorms in the air. Up, up the long, dry, after-burning view, I've topped the piddle pack with easy grace, which drinking a rippet will make you do. And while with silent, drifting mind I've trod in a narrow altitude block of space, put out my hand and slewed the sniper pod. next poem is called, Maybe I Should Have Lied. The teacher asked me to come to the class and talk about flying. He was my son's teacher and the jet's always popular. How fast? How high? Pretty standard stuff. I wore my flight suit and handed out stickers even though they weren't toddlers. One kid asked if I killed anybody. I was surprised and shouldn't have been. I told him the truth. Later that day in the squadron, I asked a buddy what he would have done. I would have lied, he said. 
I answered the question in front of my son, the only time it has come up. That's what happens in combat. Next question, please. tree and a piece of information is that people may not know that the two two of the 9-11 hijackers started their day in Portland Maine this poem is called the path through security my family lived there before it was Maine before this was even a country they still live there so we visit we fly in and out of the jet port we place our shoes in a tray empty our pockets on the way home out west. The guy asked which one of us was Grace. I pointed to the infant perched on my arm. She was selected for enhanced security screening. It's possible that happened in the same tunnel of air the hijackers passed through. The imaginary tube, the human-shaped ribbon through time, the permanent trace of their movement through space. I could see it all at once. We have repeatedly walked in the steps of those men. The hotel manager where they stayed had a nervous breakdown. I flew over the Pentagon in Manhattan one year afterward. Other deployments far away that all blend together. We drove by that hotel again as we left Maine this summer. We take off our shoes in a new part of the terminal and our departure gate is always next to the old closed security line. Little kids run around under a big toy airplane that hangs over that spot now. A child-sized control tower and terminal building instead of x-ray machines. We wait to go home, and I always look over at the playground and the path of destruction. This is Carol Fant. The first poem I'll read is called Baltic Summer. I spent the summer dreaming of trolls and trains, singing with ghosts, standing in waterfall spray with a swami, posing for pictures. I followed him through a rail car of Indian tourists, beautiful brown women with vermilion bindis, the lilt of Hindi, orange silk saris, the smell of cloves, cardamom, ginger. I spent the summer floating across the Baltic, following feathered algae trails, reading them like the entrails of doves. I spent the summer as a falconer, swinging dead pigeons around my head, waiting for the pinch of talons on my leathered arm, waiting for the wild, hooded eye. Then that afternoon in Helsinki, the squatting Nigerian man scattering silver stars and trinket moons on the street, War protesters silently marching through stands of cabbage and corn at the open air market. I won't talk about Leningrad, my loneliness there, blockade ghosts everywhere. I won't talk about my father at the Hermitage, jockeying for position with Japanese tourists, standing still for hours before Rembrandt's prodigal son, talking for days about the mystical light. I won't talk about the day in the field of Mars, the baby Russian bears, the chained one I touched, its fur sticky and perfumed, nor the caged one in the back of the tiny blue bus, bawling for its mother. That night I hid in the basement with Rasputin, vomiting caviar and tap water. I spent the summer away from myself, not wanting to see what I saw, not wanting to ever come home, but too desperate to stay. There is a loneliness in the vacuum of space, in the place a person chooses to perch, so high above his world, so far, far away. A culture of time, a dark cloud of forgetting. I will never be home again. The next poem is called Painted World. 
I'm inside my poem, trying to talk my way out of yellow and red mesas, Rio Grande mud, high desert grass. Tumbleweeds rumble past. Clouds gather over the sandias, tourmaline pink now with sunset. A roadrunner chases down a field mouse. A barn owl hunts rabbit or cat or a wandering small dog. I hide in cottonwoods, drunk with river water, and wait for fall to escape. Follow fallen aspen leaves, gold coins leading south, back home to concrete, skyscrapers, mockingbirds. But now, in the blazing summer, I'm blinded by hot color. I'll never write my way out. Across the river, two coyotes sulk along the bank, fretfully map sand and stone. I mimic their haunted saunter, hands and knees muddy, smell the ground for browns, follow vapor trails across the painted world. This is Joseph Mills reading three poems. How you know. How do you know if it's love, my daughter asks. And I think if you have to ask, it's not. But I know this won't help. I want to say you're too young to worry about it, as if she has questions about Medicare or Social Security. But this won't help either. You'll just know is a lie. And one truth, when you still want to be with them the next morning, would involve too many follow-up questions. The difficulty with love, I want to say, is sometimes you only know afterwards that it's arrived or left. Love is the elephant, and we are the blind mice unable to understand the whole. I want to say love is this desire to help, even when I know I can't. Just as I couldn't explain electricity, stars, the color of the sky, baldness, tornadoes, fingernails, coconuts, or the other things she has asked about over the years. All those phenomena whose daily existence seems miraculous. Instead, I shake my head. I don't even know how to match my socks. Go ask your mother. She laughs and says, oh, I did. Mom told me to come and ask you. Enter Juliet. Later, she would have regretted the naked photos and the lascivious tweets. She would have looked through the yearbook pictures and shook her head at the hair and clothing and posing, at the sequins, at how oblivious she was to her own gawkiness, at how she had thought she knew everything of importance. Later. But there is no later for her. No stepping from a shower in front of a mirror and thinking, my God, what happened to my ass? No dresser top of expensive creams for her hands. No night sprawled on the couch with someone who, despite her weight and wrinkles and gray, feels for her in a way that beggars description. No waking, stiff, together, morning after morning. question. Why write a poem about these black trees swaying against the plum dark sky? Why write about the wind scudding clouds and rain inland? It's not to remember the moment, to understand or to share it. It's not to bear witness to the world's strange beauty or make some statement about nature or transience. It's none of those cliches that sound profound and may even be true but come later, like all explanations, inadequate and calcifying. Even a skillful description of these trees and sky is not our trees and sky, which are ours because of the cheap Bordeaux we've been drinking for hours, the soreness from walking, the bread, the sea air, the stones, the fact we've known each other so much longer than we thought we would. We have survived. And now find ourselves here, silhouetted in this late light, in these lives that leak palms like runoff from storm-shook trees. This is Pauletta 
Hansel reading three poems. Strawberry Moon. This morning's first waking as light eases through whatever opening it finds and the owl's low question pulls me from sleep. I don't remember my dreams anymore, not as I did, enthralled by my own night wisdom spiraling from sleep's deep spring. Now I wake with worry, knowing what I know is never enough. My mother still knows me most of the time, and mostly that is enough, that she knows me as I knew her before words, as touch and safe and the giver of food that I ease between the lips that open and close, opened and close. The strawberry moon slips behind a cloud, spilling its light as it goes. Tending Green, One. I come upstairs to write, still smelling of cilantro from my husband's herb garden. His garden, I say, though I'm the one out there nipping buds that should not be left to flower, watering what's new and tender, trimming back last year's rosemary, oregano. All winter, we plucked leaves from their half-frozen stalks and crushed them into our warm pots, the whole house smelling green, as I do now, green spilling onto my page, flecks of its sticking between my words like bits of salad between teeth. Two. My husband said his friend spent the weekend digging up his dead wife's roses. Couldn't look at them again this summer. Last year, he'd let the weeds grow tall and mingle with what's left of the domesticated wildness she had tended in the years before he'd turned to tending her. Now he's turning her garden back into suburban green. Three. He is not much for green, my husband. He's more of a dirt man, working thick clumps of compost, peat moss, manure into the ground where through the winter my flowers sleep. In spring, their leaves come up a swath of green with buds that open to a crazy quilt of color. My flowers, I say though he's the one who made the beds, digging the holes for the roots to go down deep beneath all that green. Four. It makes it easier to mow, so said my husband's friend, with, I imagine now, a glance away and out the office window. So lush the spring, it grows so fast, it hurts your eyes, so green. I decided to go barefoot, the way another girl that summer, 72, might tuck a flower in her hair or her bra away inside a drawer. I can't remember now enough about the self that chose that path. Maybe barefoot was a fashion I could hide beneath the fraying bottoms of my jeans, or only that there were so few for me to choose from, my hair too frizzy to grow long and toss back from my eyes my legs in miniskirt, more cherub than share. Even then my body urged toward metaphor. I longed to toughen up, control the tears that roiled at everything and nothing, fogging my new glasses. Perhaps the burning pavement underneath my soles was salve against a deeper heat. There was no place to go, one street through town and back. Daily I walked it, never looking up to see what they might think of my bare feet, the farmers and the miners come to town, the pool hall cowboys lounging taut against the doorways as I passed, eyes down to guide my feet around their pop-tops and tobacco wads, their stubs flipped burning to the sidewalk, their gaze that rose to linger on the body in which I could no longer hide. This is John Sibley Williams reading two poems. 
from my new book, As One Fire Consumes Another. This poem is called Pinata. Body broken into, all the sweetness torn out. Brightly dyed paper flakes linger in the grass as if someone has sanded down the sun. The husk of an animal hangs loosely from a sky clouding over in storm. Tomorrow, he will be a man. Until then, sticks are just sticks. Thrashing the insides out of some martyred paper beast is play. Lollipop, marzipan, tamarind, Fire works its way up the arm into bottle rocket, into bang. The sky glimmers and is gone. And whatever the children can carry home in their teeth will be theirs. This next poem is called The Crossing. Tell me what not to do with heaven-faced children torn between parents who are torn apart by a river tearing a long muddy scar into this long and lengthening landscape. Then tell me again why we are the only animal bound by maps shifting allegiances. Tell me what not to forgive of stars, what skin my skin is forbidden to touch, what heart my heart cannot possibly hold without breaking. Don't tell me the best way to break a body without damaging its shell. We all know how that story ends. Ask the bridled horses, Ask mothers waiting by docks for warships never to return. Ask any long, cold winter night in any part of any country any child has ever fled to find herself no closer to home. Please tell me what road that begins in ruin ends somewhere beautiful. I hope you enjoyed today's co-creative listening experience. Please remember to leave a comment about the single greatest takeaway for you today. You know, that one thing you will remember from this day forward. Was it something funny or provocative? Was it just what you needed to hear? Please share so we can all benefit. And remember to return Tuesdays and Thursdays to Accept Your Gifts, the 22-minute podcast for inspiring your most creative life.